Good evening, everybody. This is our July meeting. I hope everybody's bees is doing well. Um, I know we've had a lot of cancellations here in the honey house for extractions due to the bees eating the honey. And that, I, I would not blame them for the, the kind of weather we've had here lately. I'm sure Blake will talk a little bit more about that in the tips. Um, if, if you're looking in your bees, please make sure they've got plenty of feed and check for your mites. That's, that's one of the bigger problems. And um, I've had a lot of people asking about high beetle. And yes, we've been seeing lots of high beetle here lately. Uh, one, because we've had all that rain with moisture. So they've had a good time to uh, uh, pupate down into the ground and create high beetles. So we've been, been a little bit more influx, but I've seen them kind of dwindle down. Uh, so um, just be advised that there, I'm seeing a lot more high beetles in, in, the, in the hives itself as we go around. So Blake, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and get to the tips and then I think Natalie's gonna come in about seven o'clock. Great, well, uh, welcome to July, everybody. Um, we are gonna talk about, like Skip said, a little bit about what I'm seeing out in the bee yard, which, um, you know, isn't, isn't the best year I've ever seen, but, but we'll certainly talk that through. Uh, don't forget to watch your smokers, it's getting hot, and uh, in some areas it's getting dry, other areas not so much. This was not from this year, this was from four or five years ago, back when we used to not get rain in July. And uh, a beekeeper a friend of mine set a smoker down in the wrong spot and forgot about it, and the grass caught on fire. And uh, as you can see, beehives burn quite well with all that wax in them. So uh, practice proper smoker care, especially as we get hot and dry, and uh, make sure that you're not setting those down in the tall grass. So we're gonna talk a lot about winter preparation. And I know that that's a strange thing to talk about in July. And so certainly not something most of us are thinking about or, or it's not anywhere on our radar. But once we harvest honey from our bees, you know, we're really moving into the, ne the next big event for them is winter. And, and so the actions that we start taking now play a really big role in ensuring that our bees are healthy going into winter, which is our next major goal. And so kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we, as we go through um, the rest of this bee talk tonight that, that, hey, we're getting our bees ready for winter and we need to be thinking in that direction as we as we work our bees over the summer. So the honey flow is over in North Texas. It's, you know, it, it hung on there a little bit last week. I mean, I still saw some scabiosa blooms and et cetera. And, and in some areas I'm still seeing some scabiosa blooming, especially in the more urban areas. But by and large, the honey flow is over. The bees are getting robby. They're starting to rob uh, any exposed honey from other hives or, you know, if you put a um, a wet super out from the hive, the bees will rob it. Um, and so I'm kind of seeing all the classic signs of the honey flow being, being over, you know, the Indian blankets dried up, scabiosa is dried up. Um, there's decent summer blooms on the way, which we'll show in, I'll show in just a minute. But if you haven't harvested honey yet, if you are lucky enough to make honey and haven't harvested it, you should be safe to go ahead and do so because it's they've got all they're gonna get. At this point, they'll start eating it and going backwards a little bit. So um, as far as a type of honey crop, I mean, it, it is sporadic. I've talked to some folks that actually made a 40, 50, 60 pound crop this year, but I would have to say that the vast majority of people made, you know, zero to 20 pounds of honey. It was a pretty dismal honey crop and I'm, you know, there's any number of things we can blame it on. There were a couple different weather events. I mean, that, that freeze in February was so historic. We don't really have a great precedent to look, or we don't have a lot of history to look back and see, um, you know, what happened to honey flows when it did that in the past, because it's not done that in anybody's memory. So we, you know, that could have affected flowers. Um, but I, I think as much as the freeze, we really just had too much rain. I mean, through the month of June, you know, through the month of May, and then a lot of June, it was just raining almost every day, or at least every other day. And that was really just washing all that nectar out of the flowers. And, and then when we finally did get some breaks in the rain, the, the honey flow is, you know, a week or two from wrapping up. 
And so I'm kind of blaming it on the, the rain, the abundance of rain more than anything. I've, I've, um, I've definitely had way more poor crop years due to too much rain than being too dry. So, uh, you know, we're kind of seem to be in a bit of a wet cycle in Texas. I mean, the past couple of years have just been pretty wet and, and that does make for poor honey crops. So hopefully that'll reverse next year and we'll get some drier days. Uh, but this year was certainly pretty dismal overall as far as a honey crop. We are starting to see some great summer blooms. The sunflowers are coming out, the crepe myrtles are blooming, seeing some thistles, the sumac. Um, I mean, there's some really good summer pollens uh, right now because we had because we had all that rain. Not as much nectar coming in, but the, the silver lining, it doesn't help us with our honey production, but the silver lining to all that rain is it's looking like we could have a pretty decent summer of, for forage for the bees. And then that also sets up the fall flowers really well. And again, in North Texas, we don't usually make harvestable honey in the summer or fall, but it's way better for our bees if they're bringing in natural nectar, natural pollen, and we're not having to feed them supplementally like we have to most years uh, because it gets so hot and dry. But uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute, but I, I'm, I'm pushing a little less hard right now than I do most years as far as, oh, you know, give your bees some resources because by and large, they're bringing in plenty on their own. So kind of along with that, let's take a second as we get into the summer, which I, I consider the summer the most uh, dangerous time for bees in Texas. A lot of people think winter's really bad, but um, in my experience, summer is harder on the bees in the winter time. And if we don't take care of our bees properly over the summer, then they aren't gonna be very well set up to be healthy and thrive during the fall. So for, for me personally, you know, so much of my efforts in beekeeping are in the summer and the early fall to make sure my beehive is set up properly to overwinter. And so we got to look at, you know, what do bees really need to thrive? And they need protein, which is pollen. They need a variety of pollen. And, and that's something I'm seeing a lot of right now, which is good. I'm seeing multi, multiple colors of pollen coming into the hive. I get concerned when I'm seeing only one or two colors of pollen in the hive. Um, you know, usually in the summer when it's really hot and we're kind of in a drought. Um, you know, the bees aren't getting good variety to their nutrition because every different flower, every different type of pollen has different nutritional contents. And so I really want to see that variety of colors, uh, which I, which I am seeing right now, which I'm not, I, a lot of times I don't see that in July. Uh, but if you, if you start seeing, you know, only one or two colors of pollen in your hive and not much pollen in August, you know, you might want to consider, you know, giving them some supplemental protein, which we'll, we'll talk more about. The bees also need carbs, which it would be nectar or syrup, and they need to be largely free of mites. So under two mites per hundred bees, largely free of brood diseases and a healthy and vibrant queen. So that's kind of your checklist for the summer. So if you're thinking through what do I need to be doing in my bees the next three or four months, that's, that's your goal. That's what you're trying to maintain in your hives and making sure that those things are met and that'll keep your hive pretty healthy. Now we'll kind of talk about on a practical level, what that looks like and how to achieve that. Um, let's see, Scott asked a question or a comment. He said, uh, we have tons of crepe myrtles on my property and in past years, the bees seem to ignore it. This year they're all over it. So are they good for bees or no? Yeah, I mean, I, I usually see crepe bees all over my crepe myrtles. And, and yeah, I mean, it's a pretty decent source uh, for the bees over the summer. So, it, you know, perhaps there are some varieties that produce better than others. There's a lot of different varieties of crepe myrtles. But in my experience and in talking to other beekeepers, yeah, I mean, it seems like crepe myrtles are a pretty great summer food source for the bees. Oh, this is this is one thing. I just a quick quick comment: fat bees versus skinny bees. So, unlike humans, when bees eat uh, a very poor diet nutritionally, or when they when they don't have enough nutrition coming into the hive, they tend to get really thin. Their fat cells in their bodies tend to start shrinking, which means that they can't withstand uh, diseases as well. They can't withstand varroa mites as well. It compromises their immune system. So part of making sure our bees have plenty of nutritional resources over the summer 
uh, helps ensure that our bees fat cells stay strong and vibrant. And, and that really allows the bees to um, raise the proper type of uh, winter bee uh, throughout the late summer and going into early fall because bees rear different types of bees in the summer or really in the spring versus the late summer, early fall. You know, in the springtime, bees know that, hey, bees are only going to live six weeks. They're going to work themselves to death. And so they often don't put quite as much effort into raising some spring bees. Well, when they start raising the generation that needs to survive over the winter, they might need, they need to live for six months. And so if the bees don't have the proper nutritional sources going into late summer, early fall, then they can't raise healthy enough bees to survive over the course of the winter. So that's why we pay so much attention over the summer and into the fall about, hey, do your bees have enough food? Because a starving hive, whether starving from protein or starving from uh, carbs, if they're starving, they're probably not going to make it through the winter uh, because those bees just won't have the longevity that they need. And so, you know, this is just a bit of contrast you often see. You know, the picture on the far right, it's not uncommon in the spring to see these frames that are almost completely pollen. You know, in the summertime, we tend to see pollen more scattered throughout the hive. Uh, and a, a rule of thumb I like to go by is I want to see in the summer, um, I want to see at least a half, a cumulative half frame of pollen. So if I were to combine all the pollen into one frame, I'd want it to fill up at least half a frame. Now that's for a strong hive, you know, that's for a hive that's at least one deep box completely full of bees, if not more, ideally. That's what I'm looking for. If you've got a hive that's half a deep box full of bees, I wouldn't expect to see that much pollen reserve in there. But if for strong hives, you know, I'm looking for, you know, half a frame of pollen or more, and I'm looking for multiple colors of pollen to make sure that my bees are taken care of nutritionally. Um, you know, well-fed hives, whether it's honey or syrup, you know, this is what I'm looking for. Both of these images are indicators of a hive that has plenty of stored syrup or honey. You know, the picture on the right has that thick band of honey around the brood, which is a great sign. The picture on the left is you can see the bees are adding some new white comb uh, to the outside edges of that box. That's always a good sign. I like to see that. It means the bees are, you know, they've got enough food reserves that they're drawing out some excess comb, which is, you know, a really good sign. Um, you know, ver uh, let's see. Um, oh, Ruben has a great question. He says, is there a good way to encourage the bees to move the pollen that's in a honey super down to the brood chamber? So not really. I mean, you know, if they've got honey, if they've got pollen up in the honey super, you know, um, there's not a great way to get them to utilize that. Honestly, um, there's just not. I mean, you could leave that honey super on uh, even, even after you've harvested honey out of it, if you're, if you are harvesting honey, you could put that honey super back on the hive and just leave it on over the course of the summer. And, and the bees will pull that pollen out as they need it. Um, I don't mind having three boxes on my hives during the summer, as long as it's, you know, as long as they're a strong hive, uh, because that gives them some dead air space, which we'll talk about in a minute and helps them keep, keeps them a little cooler. So if you've got a super with a lot of pollen in it, um, that you've extracted honey out of, I would just leave it on over the summer and, and let them use it. And then, you know, in October, we can pull that super off if the bees don't need the space. Here's another great guide. I really love this one to, to help me see if my hive is, uh, has all the proper nutrition that they need. And that's well-fed larva versus hungry larva. So the picture on the far right is a good example of very well-fed larva. You can see those, those 24 to 48 hour old larva are just floating in royal jelly. That's a good sign, that's what we wanna see. We wanna see those wet larvae. Versus the picture on the left, if you look at a lot of those larvae, you know, they really look a little dry almost. You're not seeing those puddles of royal jelly underneath those larvae that, that I really wanna see. So if you're kind of seeing these drier looking larvae, you're not seeing a half frame of cumulative pollen in your hive, you're not seeing multiple colors of pollen, that's when I often will step in and give them a pollen patty, um, usually one or two a month, uh, 
to make sure that my hives are able to stay healthy, stay vibrant through the course of the summer. Which kind of leads to my favorite method of, of taking care of bees through the summer, which I call trickle feeding. And it's essentially feeding them small amounts of food throughout the summer, if it's needed to simulate a natural flow. So for pollen substitute, that looks like feeding two one pound pollen patties per month with the caveat that you don't wanna feed more pollen than can be eaten in one week. And, you know, again, this year that for July, I'm not really recommending starting this yet because we, I'm seeing a lot of great pollen coming in. Um, if we keep getting rains, you may not need to feed pollen substitute, but most years in Texas by August, everything's kind of dead and burned and dry. And uh, that's when I start saying, okay, if I'm, if those criteria that I mentioned earlier, if I'm not seeing that in my hive, then I step in and give them a couple poll pollen patties per month. The pollen patties aren't going to hurt the bees during the summer. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, and so, uh, you know, it can really help boost up their, keep their immune system strong, allow them to really raise those winter bees that we need to be raised. And then as far as feeding sugar water over the summer, you know, um, trickle feeding, I would feed one fourth to one half a gallon per hive per week for hives that are at least one deep box full of bees or more. However, that's often not needed if your hive has a second brood box that's full of honey. Um, I mean, the preference is always to let the bees eat their own honey. Um, that's better for them. Um, but especially in years like this, some hives, even good hives, didn't make any honey. And they may have 10 pounds of reserves of honey in their hive, and they're going to starve to death over the summer if, if they're not fed. And, and it doesn't mean your hive's just going to die, but they're going to be in such a weakened state um, that they won't make it, you know, once we get into winter. So the rule of thumb I like to go by is I like to maintain 30 pounds of stored honey or syrup in my second brood box over the course of the summer and, and winter even. So I, I, 30 to 40 pounds is my target uh, that, I, that I try to maintain. If I don't have that in my hive, then I'm gonna feed them to help get them there. Uh, hopefully they've got that from natural honey, which is again, ideal. But if they don't, I step in instead of letting them uh, starve to death. So um, I think that is it on that. Um, let's see, we're doing okay on time. So a couple just, interesting things while we're talking about summer there's a couple different things if you if you say hey you know i want to keep my bees busy this summer and uh you don't want to just let them sit you can uh I, i've done this a number of times it's kind of fun i get them to draw out the foundation that i need for next year so for my really strong hives that are you know two boxes two brood boxes full of bees and brood uh with a great bee population then um, you know, I'll put a deep or a medium box of foundation on top and I'll do that trickle feeding uh, with one to one syrup and, uh, you know, feed them a fourth to a half a gallon of syrup per week and get them to go up and that'll encourage them to draw out that third box of foundation. And then next year, I've got my foundation drawn out. So I stand a much better chance of making a better honey crop next year because the bees don't have to use all that energy drawing out comb uh, during the honey flow. They did it in the summer when they weren't doing anything else. So um, again, the caveat there is the hive has to be really, really strong uh, um, to, to pull that off. But if you have strong hives, it can work. Um, Nancy, you asked, uh, my, you said my brood box is almost, your bottom brood box is almost empty, but there's a super with honey above the top brood box. Should I swap the two brood boxes? So um, yeah, I mean, if, if your bee population, I, I would look mostly at where your brood is and your bee population is. So if your bees and brood have largely moved up into your upper boxes and your lower box is virtually empty, yeah, you can switch those. I mean, the bees, na bees naturally like to move up. You know, they naturally move and work upwards. So um, yeah, so I mean, if you've, if you've got a situation and that's really common to see in the early spring, like February, but yeah, if your bottom box is pretty empty, your top box is really full, you can absolutely swap those. So varroa mites, uh, this is a big month for varroa mites because uh, we usually see 
you know, those bromide levels peaking um, in July and August is, is when we see varroamite levels peak. Um, I would say varroamites are typically the leading cause of uh, winter death. And, and usually what we see for varroamites that are unmanaged is they get to a very critical high level in July and August and they weaken the hive, the varroamites themselves weaken the hive, but the viruses that they transmit also weaken the hive. And then you see that hive crash in the fall and die in the winter. And it's kind of hard because you may not notice much of a difference in your hive over the course of the summer uh, because it's still warm, there's queens still laying, brood still being reared, uh, but then we see that crash in the fall and winter. So um, it's really important to monitor your varroa mite levels and have a plan to combat varroa mites. And you know, just keep in mind, don't visually inspect your hive to see if varroa mites are there. Number one, varroa mites are there. I mean, they're in all hives, essentially. Um, but don't just look at a hive. You know, you've got to do an alcohol wash or a sticky board test. Um, you know, we don't have time to get into those tonight. Um, you can check out our uh, Texas Bee Supply YouTube channel, and we've got videos on all of that. But, um, you know, do a test, see where your varroa mite levels are, and then act accordingly. Um, let me go back one here. As, as far as how to take care of your varroa mites, that's personal preference. You know, I mean, some folks want to be treatment free. Some people want to uh, use use a treatment. Some people use want to use an organic treatment. Some use want to want to use a synthetic treatment that is just super effective. And that's just up to you as a beekeeper. I mean, um, you know, I'm not adamantly pushing towards any one. They can all work. Um, what I really like to do is use what I call uh, what a lot of people call an integrated pest management pyramid where you kind of start at the very bottom with genetics. You start with the right genetics. And then, um, you know, if, if you get critically high varroa mite levels and, um, and you see the hive is starting to suffer from it, then you can move on to uh, mechanical methods or environmental methods to handle varroa mites. If that doesn't work, then you can go up to some organic treatments. If that doesn't work, you can go up to synthetic treatments. Um, so there's kind of a pyramid you can follow. And that's typically what I recommend. Another really awesome resource is the Honeybee Health Coalition. You can just Google uh, Honeybee Health Coalition Varroa Mite Tool. And they've got an awesome uh, 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 computer program, I guess, really, that walks you through the time of year, what's going on in your bees, the strength of your hive, and do you want to be treatment-free or not? And then it makes a recommendation on, okay, based on all the answers you gave, here's a treatment that you can use or a method that you can use and here's how to do it. So it's a great tool that I highly recommend to help kind of walk you through what to do about varroa mites. The one thing I really want to emphasize is that doing nothing um, typically leads to most, if not all of your hives dying. Um, so don't, don't just do nothing. Uh, you know, bees typically don't just you know, if you just buy a hive that didn't have any genetic resistance to varroa mites and put it in your backyard and say, well, I'm just not going to do anything and hope that they develop a resistance to varroa mites, doesn't really work that way. Um, you know, those that raise bees successfully uh, to resist varroa mites naturally put a tremendous amount of time and effort and energy into making sure it's done properly. So, um, Anyway, that's all we can really cover on varroa mites because it's getting a little late. But, um, you know, uh, the, the caveat, the important thing is, you know, use, um, do some research, do some digging, take some classes uh, to really make sure you know how to handle varroa mites. Let me get to a few of these questions really quickly. Uh, Brad, you said, how long do you typically leave your wet supers on after putting them on a hive for cleaning? Brad, about 24 hours is all it takes. So within 24 hours, the bees can fully clean up a super uh, with no problem. I do add those wet supers on late in the evening um, and let the bees clean them up overnight. If you put them on early in the day or in the middle of the day, you'll often create a robbing frenzy because those supers smell so strongly of honey, kind of attracts all the bees in the neighborhood. So when I put wet supers on my hives, I put them on in the evening, the bees clean it up over the night and then you can, you could even take them off the next morning. Sometimes it often within, you know, by the next morning, the bees will have cleaned it up. 
Um, someone else asked, uh, when you draw out foundation for next year, do you leave those frames on the hive throughout the year or do you remove and store them until next year? So you can do either. I mean, if the hive is really strong and they're filling up all those boxes with bees, you can just leave them on. Um, if, uh, you know, by when October comes around, if, if the bees really, there's not many bees up in that bo upper box, then you can pull it off and store it for next year. Uh, someone else asks, my nooks have some honey in the supers, but they haven't capped the cells yet. How long does it normally take to cap those cells? So uh, when a honey flow ends, sometimes bees don't finish capping. Sometimes they'll never finish capping that honey because uh, they run out of natural resources to keep building that wax to cap honey super. So do what we call a shake test where you hold a frame horizontally over your hive and shake it and see if you can shake any nectar out of it. If that nectar just kind of rains out like a shower, then it's not cured and it's not ready. If that, you know, if you only get a drop or two and that nectar really isn't raining out if you shake it, typically that means it's cured and ready to harvest. Okay, last question here before we move on. Dave, you said um, you've already harvested this year and you're about to put Apivar strips in, which is a varroa mite treatment. Do you need to take the supers off or let them be? they are already putting more honey back into the supers. So um, I recommend pulling your supers off for the Apivar treatment if you're gonna use Apivar. Um, that's debated a bit. A lot of beekeepers, understandably, I mean, say that, well, that residue has a pretty short half-life. Um, you wouldn't wanna put the strips in the honey super, uh, but if it's in the brood boxes below, and the honey supers are on top and the bees aren't gonna, you know, you're not gonna eat honey out of the supers uh, and it, you know, it'll be emptied of honey and stored and then reused the next year, you know, potentially it'd be okay. Um, my general preference is to pull those supers off. Um, if your hives are really full, um, then you could just put a box of foundation on top. And if they, if they are bringing in excess honey, then they could just draw out that foundation for you. But in general, I do like to pull them off if, if possible. Okay, um, I believe I'm supposed to end at seven. So in a couple quick minutes, uh, I'm gonna hit a couple other topics. Bearding is something that's really common to see this time of year. You know, all these hives have different types of bearding. When bees get hot, especially um, in the evening when all the foragers start returning to the hive, a lot of times some of them will hang out on the front so that you don't have so many bodies packed into the hive and potentially overheating it. So bearding is common, I don't worry about it. The one thing I do is if I see a hive that's bearding a lot, like kind of any of these, I just make sure they've got enough room. You know, if I go out there in the evening or early morning, open the lid and all the boxes are just packed full of bees, I add another box. Um, they don't really need it for honey storage over the summer, but I like to give them another box to give them more room to spread out and stay a little bit cooler. Which leads us to cooling hives. You know, should you do anything to help keep your hives cool? You know, the, the best thing to do is provide a water source. Uh, you know, I'd say what's perfect is hives that have uh, shade and the heat of the afternoon. Um, and then sunlight the rest of the time is, is ideal, but that is difficult to find. So that's ideal. Um, things like screen bottom boards are helpful. You can do an upper vent, like you see in the lower left-hand picture where you crack that lid just a little bit to give the bees an upper vent. Um, you can put a, like this upper right picture, you can put an empty box on top of your hive and then put the lid on top of that, kind of create some dead air space so that hot sun isn't beating down right on top of the top bars of the hive. Um, you know, I, I don't really recommend full shade as I still recommend sunlight, uh, but afternoon shade is, is nice if you can do that. The one thing that I, the, the only time I recommend full shade is if you've got a single story hive during the summer, uh, because single story hives, uh, in the studies and tests I've done struggle a bit more keeping their hive cool enough over the heat of the summer versus a double deep hive or a deep and a medium where they can kind of get away from that heat that's pounding down on top of that lid. Um, so in general, I've solved that just by making sure all of my hives have two boxes on them throughout the summer at a minimum. So uh, last thing and I'll wrap it up is just empty supers. Don't forget to store those in a freezer or use wax moth crystals or use, uh, I'm blanking out on the name of the, uh, 
the spray that you can use that's uh, uh, the, the, I want to say the nematodes or I forget, I forget the name of it, but. Um, like you talking about Sertan? Yeah, Sertan. Um, yeah. So, or, or, you know, whatever method you're going to use to protect your supers from wax malls, uh, enact it because uh, wax malls are going to eat those supers if they're not properly stored. And don't forget to provide a water source for your bees, which isn't as much of a problem this year with the rain we've been having. But as water sources dry up over the summer, make sure that they've got a water source um, as needed. So that's the it. Um, Skip, I'll turn it back over to you unless there are any questions. Yeah, Sertan is, is BT. Yeah, is a biological control for the wax moss. Thank you. Yeah, that's from, yes. that's from Nathalie. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Nathalie. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. So whatever method you're going to use, yeah, go ahead and enact it. And that's a, you know, that's certainly one to, to give a shot and try. It's a good one. So. All right. Okay, Skip, it's all yours. Thank you, Blake. And thank, thank you, you for some updates and uh, always look forward to the tips. My um, pleasure. We do have Natalie on today. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about, I think it's the what the best bees are or best hives to do for some, some beginners. Um she is a, a, a very renowned beekeeper. No, oh, thank you. Uh, I think she's uh, she's worked with Les Crowder, if I'm not mistaken, on, on some things. And and uh, I think I've read a couple of, on your, your deals. You've actually worked in the Congo in Africa on, and helping them That's do right. some beekeeping. So um, she does have a, a, a natural way to do some beekeeping. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from her and, uh, and what she has for us today. So it's all yours. Well, thank you so much, Darren. It's a treat to be here. And I have to apologize for last month, <laughs> uh, family emergency and, and missing the meeting. So I appreciate you guys' patience and welcoming me back. So thank you for that. Thank and you. yeah, thank you. And for, uh, you know, you said it, I'm going to talk about what kind of hives to choose and when you're getting started, especially and what works best for what works best for you, for your goals and needs. So um First of all, let me go back to my screen so I can go. Yeah, there you go. So my name is Natalie. I'm a Texas a and Master Beekeeper. I work with uh, Les Crowder. Who, together, we have over 55 years of experience and thousands of hives uh, you know, of different kinds in different countries. Um, Les needs no introduction. He's an expert beekeeper, a biologist. Uh, he's also a philosopher on his spare time. And I'm really grateful to have him as my mentor and my friend and to be able to work with him at Be Mindful. So I wanted to mention um, that. Uh, I'm also the natural beekeeping corner uh, host at the Hive Jive, the podcast uh, that's hosted actually by John Swan, the vice president of the Texas Beekeepers Association. And every month I do their natural beekeeping corner. So if you are, if you listen to podcasts, I really highly recommend that one. And also if you're looking into ways to um, get a little bit more natural, a little bit more sustainable in your practices, uh, the first Monday of every month is when I host that natural beekeeping corner. Um, Les is the author of that very famous book, Top Bar Beekeeping. Excuse me. <coughs> it is Texas and my allergies always hit me up when I get started on presentations. So um, he's got that book that's uh, basically about organic practices for honeybee health. And it's focused on Tabar hives, but it applies to the principles of beekeeping that he describes in the book apply to all kinds of uh, hives. And it's about sustainable, more natural uh, beekeeping. So let's talk a little bit about what our agenda today. I'm going to do a little bit of a public service announcement about natural beekeeping principles, just because it's who I am. And <laughs> I can't get a presentation started without mentioning some of that stuff. Uh, and then we're going to talk about to decide what kind of hive works best for you and why it's a good idea to define your goals and your needs. Then we'll dive into actual first, I think, vertical beekeeping and then horizontal beekeeping or vice versa. I, I switch, switch, switch back and forth, so I don't remember uh, <laughs> if the agenda matches the order in this case. But And then we'll talk a little bit about resources. So let's discuss a little bit. I know we have only have one hour and I have a lot to mention, so feel free to type your questions in the uh, chat window and I can address them at the end. If you want to interrupt me, feel free to do that if it's really urgent. I'm going to try to uh, go through those slides fairly quickly and then leave you guys some time at the end to ask questions. So um, 
the important part for natural beekeeping principles is to understand the integrated pest management pyramid and its principles. Um, in short, it's IPM, Integrated Pest Management, and it's a scientific um, combination of, I mean, it's a scientifically based research that came up um, with strategies, pest management strategies. Um, all animal husbandries have their own sets of IPM strategies, and beekeeping is just like the other animal husbandries. It has its own sets of uh, pest management strategies. And the way this works is that it integrates a combination of tactics to reduce the pest population and the pathogen impact that these pests may transfer. So, and, and it, it's looking to do that in a very non as non-intrusively and as effectively as possible. So part of the, um, I want to remind everybody to be mindful of that because a lot of that is usually lost and um, the strategies are um, used in the wrong order. So the five steps that I'm looking at in integrated pest management is um, educational, cultural, physical, biological, and chemical, and they increase in order of um, severity of intervention. So it can be represented by a pyramid, just like you have the food pyramid and those uh, five levels, education which is basically identification and understanding of the pest, but also the life cycles of both the honeybee itself and the superorganism because they have their own specific uh, cycles. Uh, the honeybee goes through, you know, workers go through uh, the, the number of days to get to maturity, the drones to their own, the queens to their own. So they have their own life cycle, but the superorganism goes through a yearly cycle and follows the seasons based on forage and weather. Um, so there's cycles of um, dearths where they're contracting and cycles of a plenty nectar flow where they're expanding. So that's for the superorganism. But the bottom line here is I wanted to remind people that prevention of problems is what matters rather than intervening, intervening after the problems arise. So concentrating on understanding the superorganism and the bees, identifying and uh, knowing the symptoms of pests and pathogens is really the most important part so that you can really uh, know when you need to do something and not uh, prophylactically intervene with treatments and things like that. The second step is gonna be cultural controls and sanitation. And what I mean by cultural controls, um, that's mostly keeping good stock, good genetics, um, local survivor stock that's not treated, that's gonna be more resilient and more tolerant of the pests and uh, um, resistant to the pathogens or diseases that they transfer. The sanitation is more like keeping uh, old comb out of the hive and just keeping your equipment sanitized and avoiding contamination across hives and or apiaries. Physical and mechanical is gonna be things like uh, traps or um, uh, preventing pests from going into the, uh, the hives, like um, uh, also like rubber screens, uh, small hive beetle traps, uh, smaller entrances, all that stuff that's going to allow you to protect your colony a little bit better. And as a general rule, the uh, integration, integrated pest management pyramid um, allows us to stop at that level. That's where Les Crowder and I stop, because if you do all these uh, strategies, and we have a talk specifically on that, so I don't want to get into all details, but if you do all this, typically you should be able to control issues. And really the key is keeping good stock. Right, anything that's going to be treated is going to be weaker than things that are not treated that are uh, survivor, and um, just kind of like multiple uh, choosing a bunch of the uh, strategies in that IPM pyramid to stack the deck in your favor is going to allow you to prevent rather than intervene. And the next step after that is going to be the biological intervention, such as what we were just talking about is uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, the BT insertin to prevent wax moths from. Um, uh, getting into your combs, it's innocuous to the bees, it's non-toxic to the bees, uh, and it allows you to protect your colony from wax moth damage. Uh, there's other strategies like nemato nematodes into the ground, uh, pseudoscorpions that are califers that are going to be actually predators of mites. Those are biological controls that can be used. However, the research is not very... Um, uh, extensive on those biological controls, except maybe for uh, certain, and um, their application requires um, multiple applications. Usually it's not very scalable, especially at a larger scale. So 
look at those as still something that you could do. We don't do that because we take care of the problems at the bottom of the pyramid. And then the last intervention on that integrated pest management pyramid is the chemical intervention. And that includes things like essential oils, that includes uh, formic acid, that includes oxalic acid, that includes all the organic acids that are um, uh, basically organic kind of interventions and all the synthetic chemicals, um, you know, Akistan, Apivar, all that stuff. So the goal is to really not having to um, use all that stuff. So we always tell people don't remember to not flip the pyramid on its head uh, by prophylactically using those treatments as a silver bullet to protect your colonies when really you should be doing the work at the bottom of that pyramid and keeping good uh, stock and, and understanding what you're seeing in your colonies when you go and inspect and identifying problems before they become too serious so you can intervene in a timely fashion. So that's uh, very important and, and keep in mind that uh, no amounts of treatments are gonna make you, bees that are dependent on treatments any more resilient to the mites and pathogens. Um, so just kind of try to get local survivor stock in your apiaries and, and get educated and um, minimize the stress on your colonies. So, so that was kind of my, my, uh, <laughs> my PSA, like I was saying. And if you're looking for survivor stock providers in the Americas, we have on our website a resource page that um, has a lot of uh, treatment-free or um, providers or educators that do that on a daily basis. So um, also swarms and um, cutouts can get you uh, some good local survivor stock. You never know what you get when you're catching swarms or getting cutouts but you have a higher chance of um, um, getting that kind of stock than buying treated stock. So uh, the other uh, public service announcement would be to look at honeybee diseases and pests. That's an excellent publication from the Canadian Association of Professional Apiculturists, which is beekeepers. And that has a lot of the symptoms and the intervention strategies that you could use if you see issues with, with your um, colonies. I was just in a, a customer's yard he had 12 colonies and he bought them from treated stock and all 12 of them needed requeening uh, because they were failure to try, thrive. They were um, either some of the queens got taken out or they were not really, I mean, low numbers of population. Um, there was a whole host of issues. So be mindful of that and make sure you get good stock. So um, to conclude that PSA, uh, and staying integrated pest management is the golden rule. Get local survivor and treated stock if you want to increase your chances of success. What makes a big difference is good, good well-mated queens. You want to make sure you get queen, quality queens from um, reputable providers. You want to make sure you protect that brood's nest to minimize the stress uh, over the colony. You don't want to over-inspect. You don't want to feed unless you have to. We only feed uh, when it's an emergency. We never, ever, ever feed pollen supplements, first of all, because they're not really proven to be any good for the, the bees. And you can trigger issues when you're feeding pollen supplements. Um, when you're a backyard beekeeper, your needs are gonna be different. When you're commercial beekeepers, they're trying to brood up their, their colonies for different reasons. So that's something that they're doing there. Um, I'm going to talk about what are your goals and why do you do things. And as a backyard beekeeper, I don't see why there would ever be a need for people to feed pollen supplements because it could lead to premature swarming. It could lead to you end up with uh, a queen that's not mated early in the spring or some the death of your colony if they cannot keep all that early brooding uh, alive because they're going to go through their resources a lot faster. Um, they're not getting the natural bird breaks that they would get by following the natural cycles of uh, dearth and, and uh, nectar. So, you know, the only kind of feeding that we do is emergency feeding or you're doing something specific, like you're splitting or you're requeening or you're doing something very specific. Other than that, your bees should be able to take care of themselves um, uh, if you make sure that they're healthy otherwise. Uh, we don't encourage to look for your queen every time you go. Just make sure that you see the signs of her being there. And uh, even in dirt, you might not see eggs and larvae. That doesn't mean necessarily that she's not there. But try to not hunt for your queen every time you go in there and don't stay in there for too long. Okay, so defining goals and needs. That's what really matters in the choice of a hive. And that's where you really want to spend some time thinking through what it is that you're trying to do. Are you trying to go into more um, commercial, large scale, 
um, to do pollination contracts? Are you trying to sell bees? Are you trying to make a living out of it uh, by having a lot of colonies? Or are you trying to be more, uh, you know, enjoying a few colonies, maybe do some ag exemption? Um, are you trying to get produce some honey? Uh, you can do that in both cases, by the way. Um, but just kind of like kind of get an idea of what your uh, goals are in beekeeping and that's really going to help you decide if you are basically a commercial beekeeper you're going to want to transport those hives left and right potentially stack them up on a trailer bring them across for the country for pollination contracts um, and then potentially extract do splits all kinds of things so and that's totally justifiable and and in that case um the type of hives that you're going to want for that are going to have to fit those needs of stacking bees and interchangeability of equipment and um, and just kind of like a work with your style of beekeeping and you might want to look into feeding to fatten up your bees and get them to brood up and give them some pollen patties and and all good stuff so that's kind of what uh, that's got a little bit more of a commercial beekeeping uh, aspect to it and there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it uh, it just has a specific purpose that might or might not be yours. So the other way to do things uh, would be um, backyard uh, beekeeping, which is a smaller scale, probably a little bit less stressful. You might not need to transport things around um, and you might be more enjoying it for yourself. Uh, so the needs, the goals here are going to be different and the needs for the type of hive you're going to have are going to be different. And um, we're going to go through through the hives themselves so that you see a little bit how they can fit uh, these two different goals. So for that, we're going to talk about horizontal versus vertical beekeeping, really. So horizontal beekeeping goes in one direction only, which is basically expanding and contracting on the horizontal axis in a box that's horizontal. And then uh, if you have vertical beekeeping, you still have a little bit of the expansion sideways horizontally, but you're also gonna have uh, boxes being added up above or underneath uh, and provide a, a vertical expansion. So with that being said, what is the organization of a natural honeybee nest? You have, this is actually a little bit misleading. What you usually see is a cavity in a tree uh, with a vertical setup where you've got the combs kind of uh, getting uh, hang from a natural ceiling. Uh, and it usually has a very thick um, uh, wood part that surrounds the brood's nest, providing a lot of insulation. But mostly what I want you to remember is that that comb is, even in a vertical cavity, is hanging from a ceiling and never ever once that comb is being started at the top of that cavity, will the bees uh, create an empty space above it and uh, build upward? They will build downward with an entrance at the bottom of the, of the cavity. Now those trees can be fallen. So there's that one vertical configuration. And then you have also cavities, not just trees, by the way, that are horizontal where the bees again will hang their comb from the ceiling down uh, using gravity as their guide to make them vertical, and then they'll expand and contract horizontally. This is an example of an uh, open air hive that is building both ways a little bit. Uh, so it's got some uh, a lateral expansion, horizontal expansion, and a little bit of uh, a little bit more <laughs> vertical expansion than you would in the horizontal hive. However, what I would say um, is notice how once they've got that comb over there, that's not going to get removed and there's not going to be any empty space or change of configuration from that plant point being brought in above their heads, changing their thermodynamics in their bird's nest and, and their conditions where they're going to be forced to build upward. So uh, the value of foundationless and natural wax. Let me talk about natural wax a little bit because it, I think it, it's important to remember in your choice of hive, there's a value to um, natural wax, even when you're doing vertical or horizontal, whichever kind of hive you're going with, that's an important reminder. Um, there's a lot of chemical components in natural wax and it holds history and memory. Um, and it also is um, a, a way for the bees to transfer pheromones and, and chemical messages from the brood or, or from the nest. It removes toxin from the colony because it's lipophilic and absorbs a lot of that. Uh, and also it gets, it traps a lot of those toxins uh, once the bees um, uh, spin their cocoons. So it really serves as a repository. So it really needs to get 
to stay fresh and clean and get rotated out. So first of all, you can do that whether you have foundation less or foundation, you should really, and that's part of the IPM sanitation uh, strategies. The other thing that's important to remember is that it has a specific resonant frequency that's really matching that of the bees and the way they communicate using those vibrations to transfer messages in the dark of the, of the hive. It, it constitutes, if you want, an uh, information highway between the bees on the different sides of the comb. So to me, um, the communication is, uh, is dampened when you have uh, any kind of like rigidity introduced with foundation. And it's a, a lot more efficient when you don't have foundation because that, that vibration is not muffled. Uh, so those communications, I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I'm pretty sure, I believe that those communications are muffled and uh, it's, it can potentially negatively impact your colony when you've got too much rigidity in your comb. So keep that in mind. Now, everybody can do it whichever way they want. I want you to remember that there's things that can be done to help improve the colony health. And whatever you're comfortable with is, is what you should choose. If you're not comfortable with going foundationless, that's fine too. Just know that you know there's uh, things that are left on the table uh, in that case. The other thing about natural wax is that the bees can build the cells to the size they need, whether they need it. Uh, so very often at the top, they will build larger cells to hold honey above the brood's nest. Um, and then they'll have uh, various sizes cells uh, usually to kind of accommodate both during the various cycles of seasons and, and um, where it is in the brood's nest, what they need it to be to optimize the configuration and uh, the way they maintain temperatures or, or, or um, raise their brood. Also, it allows them to rear some drones, which is uh, a healthy part of a healthy colony. A lot of beekeepers like to call out the, the drones or prevent them from rearing drones because the thinking is that then they'll have uh, less resources for the workers that are bringing the honey. But if you think about it, the whole uh, um, colony, the superorganism works as a unit. So that's important to let the bees um, build their own cell sizes. Also, very often the foundation imposes upon them a specific cell size, which is larger, 5.4 millimeters, than what bees naturally uh, uh, build. And that has a negative effect of extending potentially the life cycle, I mean, the, the capping uh, cycle of the workers and the drones, uh, well, not the drones, but in this case, the workers, and uh, making bigger bees. And what happens is um, there might be a correlation with, between that and the um, number of uh, progeny a mite, a foundress mite can have under the cappings if you extend that, that capping time for the bees that are bigger. So by letting them build the cell size that they need, and I'm not even talking about small cell size, I'm talking about natural cell size. The bees actually uh, typically will regress in, in, and make smaller bees. That's, you're gonna find that feral bees have smaller cell sizes. And I think that matters in your, uh, in your IPM strategies. That can be something that you can use to your advantage. So again, you can have on the same comb a natural uh, wax, you can have worker comb, you can have uh, drone cells, you can have queen cells sometimes, and usually it's not pictured here, but at the top you'll have uh, honey and those are larger cells. So you can have all kinds of different cells. And uh, I think that there, there's a reason for the bees to do what they do. So it's important to remember. Uh, this is to kind of illustrate. So my, my really good friend is uh, Steve Butler from Company B. He's a remover. He's been doing that for over 50 years. I think he said 60. And he um, um, has thousands of removals under his belt. And he said by far, probably about 90% of his removals are in horizontal configurations. A lot of soffits, a lot of things that, you know, apparently the bees are, uh, are picking horizontal style configurations. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now let's go back to commercial versus backyard beekeeper. I also want to remind you that from the slightly over 200,000 beekeepers in the United States, 95% of them are backyard hobbyists. And that the commercial or even sideliners that are larger uh, beekeepers but smaller than commercial producers are together constituting only about 5%. So the chances are 95% uh, chances are that you are probably in the backyard 
beekeeping world and therefore you might not need to do beekeeping the way commercial beekeepers do um, so just keep that in mind you can absolutely if you want to but you don't have to right so let's talk about vertical beekeeping langstroth hives are ubiquitous they are um, made um, to stack up and use frames so that they can be inspectable and you can pull out their respective bee space they come with a variety of parts. So you have, you don't always have a high stand, but usually you have a bottom board. Sometimes it's a screen bottom boards. You have uh, brood boxes, you have supers of different sizes. You can have queen excluders. You have all those frames. You have an inner cover. You have an outer cover, whether it's telescopic or uh, regular frame uh, cover. Then you have those all those frames and. I can't, I don't know about you guys, but I cannot make those. So you have to rely on suppliers and the supply chain that they depend on and their prices to uh, get the parts that you need to assemble those um, frames. And if you are not able to assemble the frames, you have to assemble them yourself, um, which is time consuming and tedious. Um, so those hives uh, take a lot of frames. Also, so you have to kind of assemble them and can, that can get, get a little bit, you know, tedious, like I was saying. But also what you need to remember is that, yes, a lot of that equipment is standardized and interchangeable for uh, practical reasons. But very often what happens is that you have uh, 10 from equipment, the bottom box, uh, eight from equipment, and then sometimes five from equipment. And that doesn't match. Right, you cannot stack them up that way and put a cover on top. That's not going to work. So you end up with issues when you have the two several sizes of equipment where you cannot interchange, interchangeably use the equipment on each other's hives. Uh, the other part of it is that you have uh, shallow, medium, and deep sizes that fit in those different sizes boxes, and then really you cannot put a, um, a deep frame into a shallow box or a medium frame into a shallow box. That doesn't work. And then if you put a medium or a shallow box in a deep frame, then you're gonna have natural comb being built underneath. So really they don't really match that much. There's a, a certain level of uh, standardization and interchangeability, but not, uh, not quite um, as uh, much as you would want to be. If you're not keeping, if you're keeping Langstroth boxes, I would say go with the same size equipment, either eight frame or 10 frame. Eight frame is gonna be a lot lighter uh, 10 frames is going to be a lot heavier in the end. Um, and then I would say, try, if you can, go with the same size box. So if you go with deeps, everything's going to be a lot heavier, obviously. If you go with mediums, everything medium, they're all interchangeable, uh, but that's going to be a little bit lighter. So again, this is a deep right here. This is a um, second deep. Very often people will put two deeps and then they'll start putting mediums at the top for uh, supering for honey. And again, those frames are not gonna match. I call that playing musical frames, by the way. So you have that expansion sideways, but also vertically. Um, and horizontally, you also have that issue because your colonies are gonna um, expand horizontally. When you put a nuke in the brand new hive, it's gonna expand horizontally some. And you're gonna have to put the number of high, uh, frames that fit in those boxes. Uh, because if you don't, you're gonna have natural comb that's gonna get built and you're gonna have a hard time inspecting your hives. And then when you're removing, let's say here, they're check aborting. So they're putting new frames to try to encourage the bees to build new comb. Uh, well, what do you do with the frames that you pulled up? Uh, you, you can give it to another hive or you can put it on, on a box uh, above, but then you have to make sure that that box has the frames that goes with it. So for a backyard beekeeping, that becomes a little bit more um, cumbersome. Uh, then you have a lot of management issues that you have to um take care of like flipping boxes up and down when you have uh, coming out of the, the spring making sure you have your uh, honey on top and, and it's just kind of managing that vertically so that's also something that needs to be taken into consideration my biggest issue with the vertical uh langstroth boxes is all the equipment that you have to have on hand um and that you have to store so you have to have it ahead of time when, so that you have it and instead of having to run to the store, trying to get all the parts that you need to put a super on top of your hive that's running out of space or making a split. And, or um, you have extracted your honey and all of a sudden you have all those boxes that you need to put in your garage. And then all those frames with drawn comb that you need to protect from your wax moths, from your mice, from 
all this stuff. So it just kind of gets to be a lot of frames and a lot of um, equipment. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is that that equipment will uh, sustain quite a bit of damage. You, you're going to end up, because it's one inch, um, not even one inch, it's three quarters really, uh, uh, inch thickness wood that is exposed to the elements. And you end up with rusty nails, cracks, you know, boxes that come apart, that don't fit tight, and, you know, pests can get in, rotten wood, a lot of things that can happen over time with those. Um, and then those frames can get eaten up especially with the foundation when you have that, uh, you, end up, you end up having to trash that foundation instead of just keeping the frame itself. So then you have, you know, when you're not protecting those frames, this is kind of what you can see, wax moth and mice. And then uh, they don't stack very well. So unless you're a, a commercial beekeeper and you're trying to do something specific where you have to transport your hives or, um, you know, just kind of, um, trying to get with that equipment, there's not really necessarily a lot of reasons to go with that. But uh, if you do, that's something that you need to keep in mind. So a lot of backyard beekeepers use um, vertical length drop hives. So you also have some management issues where you have the brood's nest that's spread between two boxes, right? And now all of a sudden, um, when you wanna do a split or you wanna do anything, you kind of have to manage that accordingly. Uh, you can have when congestion appears, you end up having honey getting put between the inner cover and the box. They build wax, everything gets sticky. This is actually one of mine, uh, my hives. Uh, the other one is from, I think, um, what do you call that? Um, Randy Oliver. I think that's one of his pictures. Um, and then um, you can have a whole lot of these when you open up an inner cover that are right there and you're exposing the whole brood's nest letting the temperature fluctuate a lot more and letting the humidity that was contained in that bird's nest escape. And, and remember, they don't have, uh, when you're putting boxes on top, you're introducing empty space above their heads, which in nature, they'd never, ever, ever do. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. You're really reconfiguring their, their nest. Uh, then this is less uh, inspecting one of our length troughs. So you end up with boxes on the side as you're trying to inspect the lower levels. Um, you can have some weird building of that foundation because they usually actually don't really like the foundation. So they'll, they'll try to build off of it or your shoulders on the sides are not tight enough. And then all of a sudden you have weird comb built out. This is what happens when you have uh, the wrong size frames in the, in the box or you forget to put frames underneath. Uh, you have still things happening. Uh, one of the bigger issues I, I feel with the um, vertical management, and it's not just Langstroth, is that you have uh, thermodynamics that lead to warmer air in the winter is skipping uh, at the top or hitting the um, outer cover and creating condensation and um, while well, the colder air is getting sucked in. Uh, and so the condensation can drip back down on your bees and, and kill them. So what I would say if you do keep vertical management is to create some kind of insulation at the top, whether it's for the winter months to prevent the issues I've just mentioned, or if it's in the summer to prevent the opposite effect where your um, hot air gets pushed in um, um, at the top of the hive and the colder air gets pushed out. So uh, also sometimes you have, if you have too much sun on top, you can have uh, combs melting right off of, you know, get wonky, wonky frame combs um, that the wax has started to melt, especially on the side also of the walls of the vertical hives. So to prevent some of that, what you can do is to uh, add spacers on top of your covers and another layer of um, either tin or plywood or something so that you have a, a airflow going underneath. And that's gonna really help, especially if you don't have that shade, that afternoon shade uh, to protect that uh, cover from the heat. So insulation at the top or airflow at the top is really helpful when you're doing vertical management because otherwise you have chimney effects. So let's talk about uh, horizontal management. And um, I wanted to first show, we're using that with uh, community outreach um, because it's really easy, it's really economical to build those and even children can, can do that. So uh, recently went to the Houston um, Congolese uh, program for youth scholarship. We got a um, grant from the Texas Honeybee Education 
that was wonderful and and we're so grateful that we're able to use that to buy um uh beekeeping uh, suits and train those kids to um, learn about beekeeping to so that hopefully they can connect with their mothers that are not speaking english they do and then they can also learn a trade that's going to help them make a living uh, later down the road plus it's very educational so we're really thrilled and we're very grateful to the to the board for that okay so uh horizontal beekeeping at what is mostly there's several i mean there's um mostly three types of horizontal beekeeping hives there's the taba hives the uh, horizontal langstroth and then the uh, layens hive so those are the, the most famous ones so what is a taba hive a taba hive is a basically a single story horizontal box in which the natural comb hangs directly from the bars that's what forms your roof and the bar the bars touch them touch each other for uh, so and they form a contiguous roof over the comb. So, and then they, there's a rain cover that protects them from the elements. But basically the way you work those is you pull one bar at a time to inspect them and the bees build straight from the wooden bar that's usually kind of like here, a stick. Uh, so they're really easy to make from that standpoint. Then you can um, put them upside down and stand them up that way. So let's get in a little bit uh, more details about that. I wanna remind you about the horizontal expansion and this is my legend right here. Bird's nest is gonna be white. Uh, honey is gonna be basically several tones of orange. Red is gonna be pollen. And then that kind of like beige is gonna be the empty comb. So in a horizontal expansion, whether it's a taba hive or any other hive, you have basically the brood's nest right here in white, uh, surrounded by a shell of pollen when you have a brood's nest, when it's expansion time. And then you have above that basically honey um, and then uh, at the uh, coming out of the winter, you might have some crystallized honey. So you can just move it back uh, to the front of the hive. You don't have to worry about where it goes up and down. You just move it to the back of the hive, uh, to the front of the hive actually it is. And then you let them expand back uh, horizontally as the uh, season, the nectar flow and expansion happens, they will expand their brood's nests horizontally only and not vertically necessarily or very little. And so it really makes it really super easy to know where your honey is and where your bird's nest is, right? Um, it's always gonna be that kind of configuration. Uh, so that's that horizontal um, expansion. Um, harvesting is super easy. This is Les, he's got one stick with a comb that they built naturally and he takes a bucket and he cuts that comb into his buckets and he crushes and strains it at home. And then he puts the bar right back in. So remember all that equipment that was to be stored in the winter when you're done with your extraction, you don't have to do that. You put it right back into the hive for the bees to rebuild right off there. You get a lot of uh, wax, you, you get uh, comb honey because obviously you don't have any foundation. Um, and that's actually sells, if you're selling honey, the, the comb honey sells for twice as much as the liquid honey. So, um, so that, keep that in mind. Uh, even at the backyard level, you can make, uh, you can pay for your addiction and beekeeping uh, if you sell that kind of stuff. But I wanted to mention that our website has free plans. If you're any, um, if you're somewhat, you know, manual, like I'm not a woodworker, I make these all day, um, as long as you have the right tools. And um, if you don't, if you're not manual at all, you can get somebody to make them for you. And the plans are right there on our website for free at b-mindful.com slash plans and um, with some explanations on how to do it. But basically it's five pieces of wood, one, two, three, four, five to make the trough in which that, uh, those uh, combs go and then just wooden sticks basically at the top. So it can't, doesn't really get um, easier than that and it's super cheap to make. Um, you can even make it with free reclaimed materials uh, all you need to do, all you need is a couple of boards, basically a rain cover and basic tools. Uh, the biggest one would be the table saw so that you can cut the bars. Uh, but basically the pieces are very simple. Uh, the plans are all online, so I don't want to get into details, but it kind of looks like this. Very, very simple. And so simple to assemble that even children can do that. We do workshops all the time. And this is what it looks like. Instead of having a stack of frames, you end up with a, a, bar, um, a stack of bars, but here and there, there's enough for 30 hives. 
So that really doesn't take that much space. Um, compare that to the stack of frames that you had before. So if you're in the backyard beekeeper, uh, beekeeping, it's really very, very fast to put those together. This is basically the basic assembly. You can do that. Uh, you can get a kit if you don't want to cut it yourself, but it's really super easy. If you can't do it yourself, somebody can cut it for you. And, and you can put some legs if you want to be fancy and put them at, that's the other thing. You can bring it up to your level, it, whether it's waist level, you don't have anything heavy to lift up, no heavy boxes like you would with a Langstroth. Vertical beekeeping can get up to 80, 90 pounds on a, a super full of honey on the larger ones and it gets super heavy. Uh, with a top bar, the maximum is going to be seven, seven, eight pounds. So, uh, Hang on, let me kind of, and so it's really easy to make and, and um, assemble. So this is a single hive with that rain cover here. And then you can put a partition in the center or a couple or three partitions and have two colonies in one. So that even cuts back your equipment costs even more so. We've just been approved in Hayes County for quadruple top bar hives. So we're not gonna really use them for very long because those colonies are gonna expand and run out of space, but we can get started uh, with one hive that holds four colonies, packages potentially. And then as they grow, we can bring more hives and we don't have to set up all the hives initially. You can do it with um, cheap lumber that's not even necessarily straight. You can do it with mud, with bamboo sticks. You can do that as long as you put the bars on top of your cavity, you can do barrels as well. These are our fancy ones. But the key here also is the airflow that you can get underneath the bars. So you can leave those in full sun. You can uh, flip those bars up uh, side down so you can take pictures. And this is less inspecting. Like I said, you have, uh, your bird's nest is not exposed. He's picked up just one bar with one comb uh, that he's inspecting and the bees barely even know that he's here. There's no bees coming out on this one that we can see on that picture. Um, the other aspect of it is because he's not beveling the wood you have very little bit of, uh, very little point of contact. So when you have two flat surfaces touching each other, you're crushing bees very easily because they don't know where to go. Uh, with this, this really, they get out of the way. So whichever hive you pick, if you have flat surfaces touching, you end up with crushed bees. You can feed in the hive just like you would in a regular. Uh, people are not gonna steal them because they don't know how to use them or they don't, they can, they're not as easily, easily transportable. And that's something to keep in mind, by the way, if you're transporting hive, hives, it's possible to do it with horizontal hives. It's just not as easy as uh, with uh, vertical hives. So keep that in mind. If your goal is to go uh, more transport and maybe, you know, we do all our ag exemptions and we transport a lot of hives. So we still do it with um, horizontal hives. Uh, if you are going to go with a Taba hive, I would say go 19 inch and not 17 inch because your center of gravity in blue is going to be higher than the one in red for the 17 inch. And that means your combs are going to be better attached and are not going to fall out as well than on the 17 inch. So keep that in mind. You can convert Langstroth by going through the steps, take off the end piece, use it as a shelf, put a Langstroth nuke on there and open it up so that your bees expand horizontally into your top bar hive and uh, put your rain cover on top. And we've done that and it works super well. The other way to do this is by adding a top bar nuke on top of a cover and drill a hole with a hole saw and put a comb to attract the bees upwards. So it goes, the, the hole goes through the top bar nuke bottom and through the Langstroth hive cover so the bees can access it and go up and they'll start usually by storing some honey and then start building their brood's nest. Now, if a top bar hive is not your cup of tea and you are very much uh, wanting to use the frames because they do have, uh, they make it extracting in an extractor. If you have a lot of them easier um, instead of crushing and straining, then maybe you might want to consider a horizontal Langstroth. And I would argue that anybody that's got Langstroth hives, vertical Langstroth hives, would be, you know, uh, serves well to have at least one of those horizontal lengths into their um, apiary because it becomes a give all, take all. Remember that musical frames I was talking about? Well, you never know. You might have too many frames. You don't know what to do. What, where am I going to put that frame of bees or, or, or drone comb? 
Now, well, you can put it in that horizontal lane and you get the benefit of that ma horizontal management where you always know where your bird's nest is towards the entrance and your honey is always going to be there. So if you want to look at your bird's nest, you can start here. If you want to harvest honey, you can start there. And usually the bees don't even know you're in there. They will, they will, uh, I mean, I don't even smoke usually when I go in, in the back of a horizontal uh, colony. So the only thing about this um, is that they require more precision milling. Again, those frames that you are going to depend on suppliers for. And then uh, there's a little bit more crushing because there's all those flat surfaces. I have one. I actually have two. Uh, it's a good transition if you're backyard beekeeper uh, to go between vertical beekeeping and horizontal tabahais. Um, personally, I still prefer uh, the top arrives, as you can hear, because I got on my soapbox, <laughs> I'm afraid. But you manage them basically by putting those frames the same way as you would in a Langstroth hive, except they all go horizontally. So sometimes they're called long langs and coffin hives, and they can get really fancy. Um, but um, so if you are interested in long langs, I know people that make those really well and not um, charge a fortune for them. And then you have Layens hives. I have also two of those and they are deeper uh, basically than uh, uh, Langstroth frames. And they are usually, they come from Eastern Europe with colder climates. And uh, the principle is to have the honey, a lot more honey on top of your brood's nest. Um, and they are horizontal beekeeping, but just not tabar hives because they come with frames as well. So precision milling again, extractor again, and um, usually people will put uh, um, wiring inside to provide additional structure because those cones are so big that until they reach the attachments to all the sides, uh, it's kind of hard to manage. Also, uh, you're gonna have to have a, an expansion of the hive that's sufficient for you to be able to collect honey if that's what you're into. Again, know your goals and your needs. Um, but if you're looking to harvest some honey, know that until it reaches a certain size where it can re uh, store honey in the back of the hive, you're going to have that bruise nest right there. And that honey is only going to be on top, right? So you can't really harvest your honey until you've got full frames of uh, honey. So keep that in mind. But this is kind of what I was talking about. So here they've started attaching already. But you can imagine how heavy that can get also with those uh, much deeper frames. So. Uh, so I went really fast and um, I want to make sure that you know that everybody does beekeeping the way they want to. I just want to remind people that it doesn't have to be vertical beekeeping and depending on your goals and needs, it can be a horizontal and top of hive beekeeping. And our teaching up here is if you're looking for uh, several examples of those hives, we have all kinds, but um, this is where you can reach me. Uh, if you're looking for questions, the website where the plans are is b-mindful.com and then you can add slash plans. Um, if you look, there's also that uh, resource for local survivor stock providers and educators. Uh, I want to also to let you know every Thursday, five to six on Instagram at Be Mindful Honey Farms, we do a chat with the mindful beekeepers with Les Crowder and this, all the recordings are there on the Instagram profile so you can listen to them. And if you are interested, you can join us on Thursdays, five to six. Uh, and we have classes and, and all this stuff. So, but basically that's kind of like uh, what I wanted to make sure I shared with people is you have to know your goals and what your beekeeping style is going to be before you decide what kind of hive. You don't have to keep horizontal, you don't have to keep vertical, it has to fit your needs so that you can best um, uh, serve, you know, uh, be happy with your beekeeping experience. So with that, do you guys have questions? And I can look at the, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if I've got some questions. Uh, BT works for wax moths, but does not work for hive beetles. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I've seen some people in northern climates use quilt boxes. That's right. That's kind of that insulation that uh, you can put on top of uh, vertical beekeeping. Uh, and I never noted that they use it to insulate. So uh, it, there's an insulation purpose. Uh, they use them in uh, warrior hives in, in northern climates, like you mentioned, to uh, absorb some of that humidity and it does provide a layer of insulation above the brood's nest that uh, avoids that hot air from the brood's nest going upward in that chimney effect to hit the cold uh, cover and create condensation that's going to 
uh, fall back down onto the bees directly. How do you do comb honey when combs have brood and honey together? Uh, you don't at that point, you kind of, you know, so usually you want to wait until your colony has enough honey for them to share with you. You only uh, should be harvesting in theory the surplus. So uh, it's good to have a couple of combs of honey, uh, whether it's horizontal or vertical beekeeping um, per frame of brood, hopefully, or at least one to one, and then you can harvest potentially the, the extra, the surplus. And so with um, horizontal beekeeping, you have that brood's nest that's, uh, that's together, that stays together. So that honey is gonna say, be at the back of the hive. So when you know you have enough honey in the back of the hive, you can just pull out those uh, bars and harvest it and have, uh, um, um, you cut it and then you put it in a, a flat uh, surface and make sure you take it home very carefully or you could put the whole bar and swap it for an empty bar uh, into a nook box that you can transport, however you want to bring it home. You take home your comb honey and then you put it flat over uh, uh, a surface and then you cut it whichever shape you want, put it on top of a cookie uh, sheet or cookie rack so that the uh, extra honey drips down on the tray and then you can carefully put it in your container. Um, but usually you don't separate the comb, the, you don't take, you don't harvest the combs where there's Brood, and that's true also, by the way, in vertical beekeeping and horizontal beekeeping. You try to lead those combs to the colonies. Uh, for horizontal Langstroth, is it deep frames only, or could medium horizontal Langstroth box work? Absolutely, it could. So the thing that you have to keep in mind in that case is if you're doing all mediums, your box is going to have to be all mediums, right? Otherwise, if you put medium frames in a deep uh, cavity, they're going to build naturally uh, wax comb underneath. And if it doesn't bother you, there's nothing wrong with that, honestly. But if you want to keep it within the frame, then make that box, that long length trough to the uh, depth of uh, frames that you're using. Meaning if it's deep, uh, medium frames only that you have, make sure your box is shallow. I mean, shallow, medium. <laughs> it's shallower than if it was a, a deep comb. Uh, so I hope that makes sense, Mary. Uh, Carrie, I'm interested in making a taba hive. What do we do with all the extra wax? That's a very good question. So there's so many things you can do. You can make candles, you can make lip balms, you can make um, um, hive products, uh, you can make a shoe polish, you can make polish for your tools, you can make furniture polish, you can make candles, oh, no, I said candles already. Uh, you can um, melt it and use it to coat the inside of your swarm traps to attract swarms. Uh, you can make uh, Russian science, which is basically a piece of fabric that you can hang out from a, a thing or stick surrounded by uh, fabric that's dipped in wax at the edge of your apiary to catch those swarms. If you miss one, they'll have a temporary, they'll bivouac for a little bit. And so that's going to attract them. And then with a little bit of luck, if you're there, you can catch them. Or again, like I said, you can uh, you can do the swarm traps and there's all kinds of things. And it sells for so much more than honey. You could sell it and make money off of it. So it depends what you're trying to do. You can do art, you can do encaustic, you can do all kinds of things. Okay, so Mary, how do bees build comb straight down on horizontal bars versus curvy comb? So very good question. So over time, horizontal natural wax building is going to be for thermodynamics reasons and for structural support uh, reasons, the bees will have tendency to kind of curb uh, the comb as they expand. So a little bit of management when you go in, especially during uh, nectar flows, when they're building a lot of combs really fast, first of all, you want to make sure that they're not storing uh, all the honey they're leaving the, the brood's nest congested. So you kind of go back and you make space and you give them space to build natural wax for their brood's nest. Um, by pushing back those bars a little bit. And then if they curve a little bit, as you go into your inspections, you kind of push them back uh, gently with the, you know, so you're gonna have a bar, I don't have one here. I used to have one here. I think I took it outside. Um, but you're gonna push that bar, um, you're gonna push the comb a little bit gently under back underneath and it's usually at the edges. So again, hence the importance of having those 19 inch versus 17 inch um, longer, shallower combs um, for more structural integrity. 
if you have any issues with natural wax, whether it's foundationless in long um, lengths or top bars or vertical hives, um, there's things that you can do to um, cut out the comb and rehang it. Um, in frames, you can use elastic bands, or you can also use uh, what we call repair bars, which, which we use a lot in uh, top bar beekeeping, or horizontal uh, natural wax beekeeping, where you can, and again, I, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good show and tell today, but it's basically prongs of metal that are affixed to the bars that you can um, get the comb um, skewered onto. So that's, if it gets really bad, um, that, that can help. And uh, our web, my website is b-mindful.com right here. And actually, I'm going to put that. Uh, let me see if I can uh, share my screen again so that you have all the info. Uh, I guess I can share this, which is my desktop, and then go to my. Uh, eh, I don't know how I'm doing that. Post share, new share, stop share. There we go. Share screen. And then go to desktop here. And then <laughs> I'm not sure I'm doing this right, but anyway, b-mindful.com escape. Let me see. Oh, there we go. I'm screen sharing. So I think that you are seeing what I'm sharing here and all the information that you need. Slideshow play from current side is here. So hopefully you're seeing this. So it's b-mindful.com. And then you can add slash plans for the plans like this. And then you can add slash treatment free free sources for providers of uh, local survivor stock and educators. Does it answer? You're, you're welcome, Mary. Thank you for saying that. Um, John, do you guys have more questions? I hope I haven't. Uh, gone over <laughs> oh you're good and uh and we can we can add that beanbuttmindful.com to our facebook page so that people can see it there and uh and make sure that we have that information out to them good um, yeah and hopefully yeah. that makes sense anybody has any questions you can join us you can text me you can email me at be mindful honey farms at gmail.com and you can join us on the chat with the mindful beekeepers every thursdays uh, 5 to 6 p.m. And also, if you're in the Austin area, I'm at the um, HCBA, Hayes County Beekeepers Association, uh, bee store, beekeeping store on Nutty Brown Road um, every Friday, 10 to 6. And from 4 to 6, we do actually um, 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 basically a beekeeping social, informal question and answers. People bring their chairs, they sit down, we, ch we chat bees. We network, uh, we do all kinds of, uh, uh, we show them equipment, we do mini workshops, we do all kinds of things. Well, thank you very much. And I know it's great to hear from y'all. Uh, like I said, we had Les Prouder on a, a few months ago. So we got some good information from him. And I actually have a top bar we started here and it's oh, done very well. Yes. Uh, so we're, you know, we, we're trying to, to try different ones. And I'm actually working on a worry hive to try to see how the, oh. the moisture box works. That's awesome. I have two worry hives. And actually, I was going to say my my oldest hive, my first hive ever was a worry hive. And, uh, and it's uh, about almost eight years into the making. And it's I've never treated it, never fed it, never inspected it. Uh, and it's the one that is thriving. I mean, of course, it's gone through several cycles of swarming and all that stuff. But uh, I'm anticipating it not lasting much longer because in nature, that's about how much they go. Uh, but I think it's a huge success story as far as I'm concerned. And I love them. The only thing that um, I'm not, I didn't go with those as a scalable thing because you have to nadir and put the boxes underneath. And I ended up putting boxes on top because <laughs> it was too heavy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. if you have questions with any of that, we have uh, Wari, Layens, Long Langs, Top Bars, Barrel Hives. Uh, flow hives i'm getting an asia hive which is the slovenian you know az hives that we say in america um and um yeah we we love all kinds of different hives all right i definitely appreciate it like i said everybody uh beingmindful.com get get them to her site and get you know if you want to listen to her blogs and 
a different an Instagram page. You'll have lots of resources for that. And uh, we definitely appreciate you being on and, and giving us a, a different viewpoint. Exactly. And, and, you know, I get, I know I get on my soapbox, but I, I think that it's important to have those conversations and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so very much for having me and uh, letting me speak to, to your people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So everybody, uh, like I said, uh, we'll get the information posted out to our Facebook page so that we'll be able to hear and you'll be able to go to her, her page. And as far as if anybody doesn't have any more questions, uh, we are looking at uh, doing our first face-to-face -face in August. Uh, so we are trying to, to cultivate that. I, if you've read the newsletter, we are trying to get that together so we can, uh, I know I, I, I'm missing everybody uh, being able to talk to people and networking, like beekeeping. So, and then I know that uh, I did get information from the Texas Beekeepers Association that they are going to be having their conference. Uh, I'm waiting on their flyer, but it's going to be down in Galveston at the Moody Garden. So if you're going to be interested in that, you're going to have to probably book it pretty quick. Uh, but as I get the information, we'll get it posted out to everybody and make sure that, that that's out to y'all. So uh, thank you again. Uh, this is recorded. Uh, so we do post it to our YouTube YouTube channel. And uh, so you'll be able to, to see this again. Uh, if not, uh, thank you very much for, for attending. And uh, we, we will see y'all next month, hopefully in the College Center. So thank you very much uh, for attending.